a hope and a future. A hope and a future. The Lord's plan that he knows he has for us are plans not to harm us, but to shalom us, to to prosper us, to give us peace and prosperity and wholeness, and to give us a hope and a future. That's what he promised the exiles in chapter 29, and that's what these next four chapters of Jeremiah are all about. I love how the Lord has gotten us right to these four chapters, right in time for Christmas. I didn't plan this, but the Lord certainly did. I think he even planned down to the the Sundays I was going to miss because of Heather's COVID, for example, so that we landed right here, right now. I love that. Not that she got COVID back in October, but that it, it was so arranged so that right now we would be in Jeremiah 30, on December 11th, 2022. You may have noticed the prophecy of Jeremiah has a lot of sadness in it. There's a lot of weeping and tears. We've seen that, haven't we? There's a lot of anguish over the foolish and evil choices that the nation of Judah had made year after year after year after year. And the prophet Jeremiah was sent to call Judah to repent. For 40 long years, he was a broken record about their broken covenant and the judgment that was inevitably going to come. Now, he wasn't happy about it. Jeremiah didn't enjoy bringing this message, but he was appointed to do it. Keegan, would you throw up the first slide for us on the, on the wall here? Do you remember the words of his commissioning in chapter 1, verse 10? He said this, the Lord said, See today, I, Yahweh, Appoint you, Jeremiah, over nations and kingdoms to six things. Uproot, that's the name of our series. Tear down, to destroy, and overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, over the last eight months, we've heard a lot about the first four of those. Especially uprooting. And we've heard a little bit sprinkled throughout about the last two. But in chapters 30 through 33, it's almost all about building and planting. It's about rebuilding and replanting. It's all about restoration and hope, a hope and a future. And you know, and I know, how that hope eventually came to pass. Jeremiah wrote these words down more than 580 years before Jesus was born. Almost 600 years before Jesus was born, Jeremiah wrote these words down. And yet here in this ancient scroll are prophecies of the Messiah and all that he promises to be for his people. This section of Jeremiah is often called the book of consolation or the book of comfort because it's four chapters of high octane hope. It's full of promise, which is just perfect for the Advent season, isn't it? Let me show you what I mean. Let's look at chapter 30 together today. Now, we don't know when these words were written down. Many Bible scholars believe, for a few different reasons, that chapter 30 may have been written during the last fateful year before the exile. That's 587 B.C. Kind of like year 39 of Jeremiah's ministry. Right when things were getting to be at their worst, Jeremiah was finally able to say more about how things were going to turn around for the best. When things were at their darkest, it turns out that the future was actually going to be quite bright. Chapter 30, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their forefathers to possess, says the Lord. Hmm. Now you might have picked up by now that this little phrase is one of Jeremiah's favorites. The days are coming. The days are coming. That's the theme of our Advent readings this year. And it'll be the theme of our Christmas Eve service. The days are coming. 
The focus of that phrase is on the future. Jeremiah has finally gotten to the good part. I'll bet that's how he felt about it. I'll bet Jeremiah was like, finally, we're getting to the good stuff. I like talking about this. I like talking about the restoration of Israel and Judah. Did you notice it's both of them? Both the north and the south? He's almost completely talked about the southern kingdom all along, but now it's the north and the south. The north went into captivity a century before this, but they're going to be restored in the same way too. Jeremiah says, I like talking about this. I like talking about the future when it's full of hope. The days are coming. They aren't here yet, but they're on the way. Judah has not yet even gone fully into captivity, but Jeremiah is predicting beyond the captivity to the restoration. It's going to be a while, at least 70 years from top to bottom, but the days are coming. Turn to the person next to you and say, the days are coming. Some of you didn't do that. <laughs> the days are coming. Now, it's important to understand how these promises in the prophets often operate, how they are fulfilled. This is one of the trickiest parts of understanding the Old Testament prophets. I, I'm, I still get hung up over it because it's not always straightforward. Some of the prophecies are, but many of them are not. The Lord promises something through the prophet, and he says that it is surely, certainly going to happen. I will surely save you out of a distant land. But he's somewhat vague on the how, and especially on the when. And you might think, just reading it, that the when is going to be all at one time. But often it's not. You might think it because it, there isn't necessarily anything in the prophecy to indicate that the fulfillment is going to come in stages. Some people use the analogy of a mountain range to illustrate this. This, by the way, is a photo from Ben Schieffer. Ben, thank you. A mountain range. Now, if you see a range of mountains out in the distance, some of those mountains are closer than others, right? Can you tell which ones are the closest? Kind of, yeah. I mean, some of the closer ones you can tell. The other ones, it's a little bit harder because maybe because of the definition about it. You can't necessarily tell. And if they all look about the same height, some of these are lower and some of them are the same, but if they all look at the same height, which ones are actually smaller? Ben? Which ones are smaller? If they all look the same height but they're not all at the same place, which ones are the smaller ones? The closer ones, right? Yeah. And so the far... Good answer. So the far ones are actually bigger. That makes sense? So sometimes when you're, you're looking actually at multiple horizons, but you see them all together. You see, the Bible teaches the prophets can be like that. They give you this prophecy, and it's a mountain range. And actually, some of those mountains are close, and some of them, though they're all still part of the same range, are still far away. And the farther ones are actually bigger. Now, it's kind of like if somebody, who do I pick on today? Who, do, who, want, who wants, anybody want pick on, picked on today? Les. All right, Les. It's kind of like, he's a good one to pick on, right? Because he'll pick right back. All right. It's kind of like if somebody told you that at Christmas time, you're going to get presents. At Christmas time, you're going to get a tricycle, a 1967 Ford Mustang Fastback, and a pair of suspenders. And you are going to absolutely love your presents at Christmas time. What do you think? We get a nod and a thumbs up. All right. Now, you might guess listening to that, that it's actually different years, right? Right? He'd be excited about those things at different years, but they're all Christmas time. Or let me give you another one. It's like a promise that this glass is going to be filled. And some of you are like, oh no, I've seen this one, right? But the glass only gets a little bit of water right at the first. All right. 
Has the promise failed? No. It's just not all there yet, yet. But the days are coming when it will be filled. That's a lot like what we see in Jeremiah 30. There are these promises of restoration, and they obviously are about the people of Judah and Israel returning to the promised land. But they're obviously about more than that, too, aren't they? And it's not clear when all this fulfillment is going to happen. Some of it obviously comes when the 70 years are up, the 70 years that we read about in chapter 25 and last week in chapter 29. But some of the things that Jeremiah says are going to happen didn't come about in 538 BC. Some of it came about at the first Christmas time. And some of it, the tallest peaks in the mountain range, are still to come. We're still waiting for it today. The greatest thing about those promises that aren't yet fully fulfilled is that they are the biggest ones. And they include the most people. This was originally written to Israel and Judah. But over time, the recipients snowball. Like if you start at one of the top of those mountains and you start to roll and gather snow with you, and then you and I get caught up in them too. The Lord's promises through Jeremiah are a great salvation, an amazing turnaround. In verse 3, he called it being brought back from captivity and restored to the land. We sing about it this time of year, don't we? We did last Sunday when we sang, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And what? And ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. When? Until the Son of God appear. That's Christmas. It's lonely exile fixed at Christmas. And it's a great turnaround. The Hebrew there for back from captivity and restore them in verse 3 is another play on one of Jeremiah's favorite words, shuv. Remember shuv from chapter, I think it's chapter 3? We said give him a shuv. It means to repent. It means to turn. It, it, could, mean return, it could mean repent because it means to turn back. Well, here it's shuv, shuvuth. Turn the turnings. And it's not sinners that need to do it. It's God that's doing it to the situation. He's turning the turnings. He's affecting the greatest reversal of all time. The greatest comeback of all time. Because these promises start out talking about Israel's return from exile, but they end up by describing our salvation both now and forever. Isn't that amazing? Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 4. Now remember, Jeremiah is a realist, and so is the Lord. He doesn't just paint a rosy picture. He has to tell it like it is. Before the dawn comes the night. Before the hope comes the judgment. So look at verse 4. This is what's going to happen next. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace, not shalom. I thought you said he promised shalom. Ask and see, can a man bear children? No. Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. You see how this works? The next thing on the calendar, the next thing on the schedule, is the destruction of Jerusalem, probably the very next year. And the destruction of the temple, Solomon's temple, and the exile of Judah all the way to Babylon. And it will be a time of distress, pain, anxiety, anguish, horror. Ladies, don't you love it that it says, like a man giving birth, right? Ladies are like, yeah, that hurts. Right? And guys are like, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine. Well, this is like giving birth, but there's no baby at the end. This is all pain, all anguish, 
Jacob's trouble. But it's also a hope and a future. Verse 7, he will be saved out of it. On the other side of that exile is salvation. The shuv of shuvets, the, the turn of turns. And here's what that salvation will look like. It will look like emancipation. Look at verse 8. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Now stop there. Do you remember that yoke from a couple weeks ago? The yoke that Jeremiah had to wear around town? We don't know for how long, at least months. Every time he went out, he had to wear this wooden yoke around his neck. And how Hananiah dramatically tore it off him and broke the yoke. Do you remember that? And the Lord said, okay, not a wooden yoke, an iron yoke. You're going to bow down and serve Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Hananiah was not 100% wrong. He was 100% wrong about when... He said in wishful thinking that it would only be two years, two and done. He got that out of his own head. But he was not wrong that the Lord was going to break the yoke. The Lord is going to break that yoke, even the yoke of iron. Nothing will stop him from breaking that yoke. Nothing will stop him from tearing off these bonds. Enslaved no longer. Freed. When? He says, in that day. And I think that's kind of like saying, Christmas time. There's this day predicted in the Bible. It's called the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh. And a lot is predicted to happen in the day of the Lord. A lot of terrible things, judgment. And a lot of wonderful things, blessing. Blessing. And I think that that day is not just a 24-hour kind of day, but a way of talking about a time when God faithfully keeps all of his promises and all of his threats. Some of that day of the Lord has already come. The glass is filling up. Some of it is yet to come. For example, did you see what's going to happen next when they are freed? Right there in verse 9. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Who's that? Well, that's the Messiah, isn't it? That's the king that the Lees family was teaching us about in Jeremiah chapter 23 in the Advent reading this morning. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. They will serve the Lord their God and David their king, meaning David's great, his, David's, great David's even greater son. Did he come at the end of the exile? No. They struggled back into the land under Nehemiah in the, in, the, in, the, in the days of Nehemiah and there was no Davidic king on the throne. When did the Davidic king show up on the scene? And what is his name? Jesus. See, when this cup is filled to the brim of this prophecy, Jesus will be reigning over his freed people. I have four simple points this morning and they're all about this great salvation that we have in Jesus. Prefigured in Jesus' return from exile and fully fulfilled in our salvation both now and forever. Here's number one. Freed to serve. Freed to serve. Did you notice that in verse nine? That the people in verse eight who were emancipated from the foreign nations that are not, are not freed to do whatever they want. They are freed to serve the Lord their God and his Messiah. We are freed to serve. 
The Lord breaks our bonds, yes. The yoke is torn off, yes. But not so that we run off and do willy-nilly whatever comes into our heads. That just leads to another kind of enslavement. Instead, we are saved to serve. We're rescued to obey our wonderful Savior. We're freed from our sins, from Satan, and from ourselves to serve the Lord and to serve others in his name. Are you serving the Lord? In what ways? Sometimes we think we were saved to just then do whatever we feel like. But it's the opposite. We're saved to do whatever he wants us to do, which is true freedom. Jesus has broken off the yoke around our necks and he's put his own yoke on us. Now thankfully his yoke is easy and his burden is light because he is a gentle and humble in heart and in him we find rest for our souls. And that's actually the second point. Number two, we are returned to rest. Returned to rest. Look at what the Lord says in verse 10. So do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, O Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. Again, he's a realist, right? He doesn't give them this Pollyanna promise, like a smiling televangelist saying that everything's going to be fine. There won't be any problems. No, there will be problems. In fact, there will be punishment. But there will also be a remnant. And there will be a future. A hope and a future. This is where we get our sermon title for today. I will surely save you out of a distant place. The people of Israel will be returned to their own land from the land of their exile. Shuv Shuvet. And that should give them peace and rest. Do you hear the words of comfort here? Do not fear. Like the angels said to the shepherds. Do not be dismayed. You will again have peace and security and no one will make you afraid. How come? I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. And if that was true, even just a little, for those straggling exiles who came back under Nehemiah, how much more is it true for you and me who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Returned to rest. What are you afraid of these days? What makes you dismayed? What keeps you up late at night? Or first thing in your morning, you're, in the morning, you're, when you reboot, the problem comes to mind. What are you scared of? Verses 10 and 11 are going to show up just about verbatim in chapter 46, which we'll get to sometime in the spring, Lord willing. I think the Lord wants us to hear this message. Do not fear. You've been returned. Do not be dismayed. You've experienced the turnaround. You will again have peace and security and no one will make you afraid. The word for peace there is not shalom. It's the word shakat. It means to be tranquil, to be quiet. Shalom means to be whole and healthy and everything together, prosperity, but shakat means to be undisturbed. And the word for security there is sha'on. It's to be at ease. To be able to rest securely. Like when you get home after a long day and you put your feet up and everything's okay and you just rest. The CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, has calm and quiet. Because of Jesus, you and I can be calm and quiet. Now, I'm not good at that. 
But that's something for me to work on. That's not any problem of the Lord's. That's my problem. Because I've been saved out of a distant place. I don't have to run around like a chicken with my head cut off over every little thing or even over anything big. How about you? Are you calm and quiet? Because Jesus came at that first Christmas time, no matter what we're facing in life, we can be calm and quiet in him. Now in verse 12, the Lord goes back to the bad news. There's a pattern here. He starts with how hopeless they truly are, bad news. And then he injects this potent, powerful hope, this good news. Look at verse 12. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause, no remedy for your sore, no healing for you. All your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel. Because your guilt is so great and your sin so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. He's back to being a broken record. He's back to pointing out how many times they've hit the snooze button. Right, Katie? Snooze, snooze. I don't want to wake up and repent. Snooze. Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. Your wound is incurable. Your case is hopeless. On your own. But look. Look at verse 16. But all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil of you, I will despoil. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. See, that's number three this morning. We're healed to hope. We're healed to hope. The Lord himself is going to heal these people. It's going to take a miracle, so he will do a miracle. We're going to find out next chapter just how big a miracle it will take. It will take a new covenant that is better than the old one, a new covenant that we said last week will be ratified by the very blood of Jesus. But the Lord's going to do it. He says, I will restore you to health and heal your wounds. Where Judah had no hope, they now have hope. It's the turnaround of turnarounds. Where they were outcasts, uncared for by their foreign gods and their foreign nations who promised to help them but never would come through, they are now people of hope with a future. And so are you and I. You see how we get into this promise as it snowballs? Because he doesn't just heal and forgive Israel. He forgives the church, Jews and Gentiles together who repent of our sins and put our faith in the blood of Jesus. And he doesn't just heal us. One day when the cup of this promise is full to the brim, the whole creation will be healed. That's my favorite of all of the Christmas carols, Joy to the World. He comes to make his blessings known as far as the curse is found. The creation right now is groaning. But one day it will be released from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. What a day of rejoicing that will be. And that's the last one. Point number four and last. We're restored to rejoice. Look at verse 18. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and have compassion on his dwellings The city will be rebuilt on her ruins, and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers, and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor, and they will not be disdained. Their children will be as in the days of old, and their community will be established before me. I will punish all who oppress me, oppress them. The Lord promises to make everything the way it was before, And the way it was always supposed to be. 
<laughs> wow. He's going to turn everything around. The, the Hebrew there is the same words we saw back in, in verse 3. Turn the turnings. Restore the fortunes. This afternoon, read Psalm 126 for that same phrase and the joy of the exiles when it happened. Bringing the people back from exile. But more than that, He's going to make everything the way it was supposed to be in the first place, including their leader. He says their leader will be exactly what he should be, what all of the leaders were supposed to be, what were, but were miserable failures at being. They were so many thumbs down, right? But this leader will be all thumbs up. Look at verse 21. Their leader will be one of their own. Their ruler will arise from among them. I will bring him near and he will come close to me. For who is he who will devote himself to be close to me, declares the Lord. <laughs> who do you think that is? Three guesses and the first two don't count. Who will dare to come close to the Lord? Like a priest coming all the way up to the Lord in the temple. Who will dare to come this close to Yahweh in all of his holiness? There's only one who even could. The one who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus. See, this verse 1 is another prophecy of the Messiah, buried deep in the book of Jeremiah. And here's the result of the Messiah's work. Verse 22. So you will be my people, and I will be your God. Friends, it doesn't get any better than that. What a privilege. What a responsibility. The covenant will be renewed and God's people will be God's people once again. They will know him. They will walk in relationship with him. Around here we call it a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's what our church is all about. So you will be my people and I will be your God. First comes the judgment. Verse 23, same thing he said in chapter 23. See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath. A driving wind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand this. We may not get it right away. But one day, we will. The days are coming. And we can be assured that he will accomplish all of the purposes of his heart. All of his purposes of judgment and all of his purposes of blessing. Because he is perfect in every way. We can't understand that all the time. I mean, just look at the cross and marvel at what was happening there. The fierce anger of the Lord was not turned back until justice was done and seen to be done on all of our sin. But at the same time, that was opening up the way for us to be saved, to be brought back from a distant land, the land of sin and exile, to be freed, to be healed, to be returned, to be restored, to be replanted. When? At Christmas time. When did this prophecy come true? Jeremiah chapter 30. Well, it began to be filled up when the exiles returned to Jerusalem in the book of Nehemiah. And then the promise began to snowball as it headed down the mountainside. And it began to engulf you and me at that first Christmas time when God became one who was 100% God became a 100% man. Jesus was born. He came as the Messiah prophesied in verse 9 and verse 21. A son of David. A Hebrew of Hebrews. A, a leader who was one of them. One who came close to Yahweh. One who dared to come close to Yahweh. One perfectly devoted to Yahweh. In fact, who even laid down his life before the wrath of Yahweh but there's still more fulfillment to come. When? On that day. Look at the first verse of chapter 21. 
I mean, chapter 31. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they will be my people. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds to me like Revelation chapter 31, chapter 21 where he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down. Sounds a lot like Jeremiah chapter 30, doesn't it? Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You can take them to the bank. They are going to be fulfilled. They are being fulfilled, and they are going to be filled beyond our wildest imagination. This is the final fulfillment of Jeremiah chapter 30. This is our hope and our future. And what should we all do in response? We should overflow with thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing.